The theme here at a human level, as uh, you see from talk to talk, is that uh, our day jobs and our hacking are in a sympathetic resonance, which has uh, done an awful lot of work in the world over the last two decades. And it is also true of me, I suppose, uh, that uh, I ought to begin uh, an account of what has happened here from my point of view uh, by reference to my day job, which is teaching people how to be lawyers. Uh, ten years ago, when SFLC came into existence, uh, the day job part of what I was doing was uh, very much at the front of my mind. Uh, SFLC was an experiment in a proposition uh, which I had been occasionally putting forward in my usual tentative and unassuming way with my colleagues uh, at Columbia Law School for some while uh, and which had been responded to in the way my colleagues usually respond to my unassuming and tentative suggestions by uh, simply ignoring me completely. Uh, my proposition at the end of the 90s was that the debt financing system of law school would reach uh, an unsustainable level, um, maybe not quite as firm as the physical limits that Brother Martin was talking about this morning, uh, but from the point of view of anybody who worries at the, about the psychic health of students and the possibility that they will go out to make justice uh, it was equally a foreseeable crisis. Uh, and uh, SFLC was an experiment uh, for me uh, in the proposition that a self-sustaining uh, organization could be created uh, to offer a school-to-work program uh, for lawyers that would allow young people to do work that they considered socially valuable uh, while making enough to repay their loans, uh, thus beginning the process of creating equity rather than debt as the content of a young lawyer's life. Um, uh, because the rent is paid for next month and because I haven't missed a payroll except by accident in the second month of SFLC's existence in March of 2005, I, I, I am willing to say that at any rate, like Martin's uh, research calculations, uh, they are not yet proved to be wrong. Uh, and uh, 10 years is a pretty good moment at which to say not only are they not wrong, but they might even be right. Um, that is to say, it might be possible to remodel law school uh, so that this happens. Uh, but that would be very disruptive, to say the least. It would require law professors to be lawyers, among other things, which is a very difficult lift these days. Uh, and it would require uh, that people understood how to make self-sustaining projects that do good in the world uh, while giving young people a way uh, to learn their trade uh, in a meaningful fashion, and that would require law professors not only to be lawyers, but to be really sharp lawyers. Notwithstanding the improbability of that statement, I, I still believe that after 10 years we might be in a position to do this, comma, if we paid attention, comma, which we won't, period. But as long as we're all here in the room together, I will just say that that was what I was trying to do, and without silicon photonics, moreover, um, and uh, in an old-fashioned kind of way, we have sort of done it. Uh, and the reason we have done it is the people you are seeing around you. Um, uh, I told uh, Mr. Ravisher, one of the most important of our absent friends, uh, when we founded the place together, that I wanted to make it uh, uh, to Art Blakey's Jazz All-Stars. And I was willing to lay down a backbeat and do the booking. Uh, in order uh, to produce a line of stars, which, um, well, I mean, I admire the hell out of Keith Jarrett, and I have for a quarter of a century, but the people who've come out of what we do are every bit as good. Now, that's uh, what feels most important to me about the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, since I uh, decided to cut my time, it's always a challenge intellectually to a law professor to offer anything other than 50 minutes, five zero minutes, but, but I cut myself to see if I could do it. Uh, and that allows me to scant the last 10 years. I don't like bragging and there isn't a whole lot that needs to be said. I had a couple of intentions uh, beyond the day job intention of finding another way to make lawyers that would work better. Uh, one was make GPL3, 
uh, which badly, badly needed doing and was really, really hard. Um, and Richard and I had been talking about it at that point for 14 years, and it was getting to be time actually to do something. Uh, and uh, I wanted uh, to find a way uh, to scale uh, across a much broader world than the world I had gone to work uh, for when I offered Richard my services uh, in 1993, a world which contained not just the Free Software Foundation, which is, of course, the mother of all umbrellas. Uh, nobody told John Sullivan that he should say so, so I'm going to say so for him. The Free Software Foundation is the mother of all in umbrellas, and the GNU project has been kept safe uh, from the rain longer and more completely and with a more world transformative effect than any of the other things we've talked about here, just because gray hair matters, and Richard and I now have lots of it. Um, but, but, but what I wanted was to find a way to deal uh, with the needs of a community diversifying very rapidly, both in technological and methodological terms. The last conversation, which shows the extraordinary diversity of requirements among organizations and the broad uh, diversity of legal architectures which have grown up uh, in order to meet those needs under both the pressure of hostile industrial activity from the world's most deeply funded and powerful monopoly now deceased for all practical purposes in that respect, making its living out of earning patent royalties on other people's software, uh, and uh, against the occasional and growing uh, skepticism and hostility of the IRS, which appeared uh, to have agreed with my dear friend and comrade Richard Stallman that open source might turn out to be just a corporate thing after all. I won't say, though, if Richard were here, he would, that if they had simply gone on calling it free software and living a free software life, the IRS would never have been able to touch us, but that's not really very important. For the reasons Andy has offered, uh, it isn't actually whether federal tax deductibility of contributions is available. Uh, it's really how WISC is managed and how headquarters operations are created for the wonderful invisible software companies that we nurture. Uh, who restrict themselves to making product and sharing it with people who don't wear suits, don't go to meetings, don't do telephone, and certainly uh, don't want to do negotiations uh, at what uh, Bedell rightly called the tier one level, which hackers mostly don't ever want to get caught in. Tier one is to the hacker, the ninth circle of the inferno, and to wind up there uh, is a sign of treason having been committed somewhere. Uh, we are, in other words, uh, people engaged uh, in living the organizational life, <laughs> for whatever quality that may have, uh, which a lot of other hackers, thanks to us, don't have to lead. And if they're grateful, then we've done our jobs right. Um, that means, uh, among other things, that we are constantly scanning the horizon, uh, trying to imagine how to take these invisible little glass boats of ours over the same breakers which are uh, puzzling the deepest, richest, uh, and most thoughtful corporations in the world right now. And so what I really want to talk about this morning is those breakers, that is to say what is coming and how the sector of the economy, crucial to the world, which we represent, is going to fare. The answer, of course, is we're going to do just fine, because the real burden and terror is going to be for those who try to make money. Uh, but the burden and terror, which is about to fall on all of those who try to make money with this software, is dear to our hearts and terribly important. Uh, because the things that we take care of cannot survive if those people who make money out of them cannot survive. And how the industry shakes out from the multiple earthquakes it is now undergoing is a matter of the utmost concern to us. Richard likes to say that the Free Software Foundation makes free software, and what Eben does is companies and intrigue. Uh, and uh, from the Richard Stallman point of view, I suppose that's right. Um, uh, the honesty and transparency would be terrific, and there would be no intrigue if it could all be run Richard Stallman's way, um, but it can't. Uh, what Martin showed you this morning, however, is that it can't be run in the old-style secretive firm-specific way either. 
It has to be run in this remarkable middle ground, like quantum gravity. Now that Martin's down at five nanometers, I can talk about the peculiar graininess of the cosmos down there at the narrowest of scales. We live in a world where firm-dominated capitalism funded by extraordinarily efficient financial engineering now must coexist with the kind of lightly organized nonprofit structures of volunteer intellectual labor, uh, which would seem to be poles away from the economic organization of global highly advanced IT, but they are in fact now absolutely adjacent, interwoven, and neither side can exist without the symbiosis which has grown up. We made it possible for the IT industry to attain what seemed to be, Pache Martin, high levels of innovation over the last 10 years. The web, virtualization in the form in which we now all really use it, uh, and a whole lot of other things that we now take for granted are actually outcomes of community activity. Beautifully integrated, packaged, productized, marketed, and sold to everything from mom and pop businesses to the largest of three letter agencies around the world by our corporate colleagues in industry. I brought Martin, or rather Martin brought himself, because you can imagine that nobody brings Martin. Uh, uh, Martin brought himself at my invitation here uh, because I wanted to begin with the earthquake. I wanted to point out when I talk about the coming structures and disruptions of the next 10 years that these are not us doing it. I'm not calling you in to say that Mr. Stallman and I are going to push the sheet around and everybody's going to have to jump real hard. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with the human race catching up to a number of limitations and inventing its way around them. But it must be understood that the disruptions coming in the global IT industry are more severe than anything that has happened since before we arrived. And we, like our industrial partners, are now going to adjust to those changes in a process in which both the free world and the for-profit enterprises are going to have a pretty wild ride. I want to talk a little bit about what that ride is likely to consist of from my point of view and what I think is likely to happen, not because I will be right, well actually I will, but, but because uh, it is at least useful to understand what all this uh, uh, is in my judgment currently leading to. We are going to pilot this as best we can and like Martin, uh, we can't keep it secret anymore. So two things are happening, um, one of which is that the primary paradigm of information technology uh, for the last 20 years uh, was set largely, uh, well, by Redmond uh, for purposes that were purely commercial and not at all technical. The smartest lawyer who has worked in this industry, in my opinion, over the past 20 years said to me once, you know, Microsoft was never a software company. Microsoft was a platform management company, and that's correct. But the platform management that Microsoft pioneered, I guess I'll, I'll say that, though I want a more derogatory uh, verb. The, the platform management structure that Microsoft engineered lay in the, tr in the transformation of a net full of peers uh, into clients and servers. Uh, in which the concentration of power at the server end uh, was facilitated by the ability to manage the endpoint platform uh, with very precise skill, breaking things in the correct order to move people along from one place to another is the skill I have in mind. You may, as a technologist, not admire it very much, but as a businessman you are compelled to say it worked really great. It whacked pretty much everybody uh, and they didn't hate Microsoft yet the way they hated Oracle and still do. Um, the, 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 the server client paradigm uh, perished uh, some while back but nobody really noticed because what happened to the server was that it ceased to be a beige box and became as Martin pointed out in his presentation this morning, a bit-based simulation of the beige box. 
Uh, and the result was that at least for a while, the client-server paradigm still seemed to be in existence. Uh, Microsoft still seemed to have a business in selling server software. Uh, and uh, people kept writing articles about, is this the year of the Linux desktop? Uh, which is sort of the PR name of not having figured out what history was doing until it was over. Okay? It was never the year of the Linux desktop because it became instead the generation of cloud to mobile. And the generation of cloud to mobile, thanks to Google's uh, uh, development and, merchand and merchandising of Android, and thanks to the important transformation of computing from a thing done by people who know how to type to people who don't understand why the opposable thumb was created over three million years. The, the, the paradigm of how people use computers, which is in my judgment mostly deplorable, but which is inescapable now, so much the case that even walking down the street you have to avoid people who think that not paying attention is perfectly acceptable. The capturing of the eyeball in a thing in the palm of the human hand, which is actually watching them far more effectively than they are watching it, uh, has made the, 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 the server-client paradigm um, fundamentally no longer re really very important. Uh, you could say that there's a spy-master-spy paradigm, or you could say that there are implant behaviorally implanted personal tracking uh, implements and big data on the other end, but whatever you want to say about it, the, the real functional paradigm of information processing has shifted a little crucial bit. Uh, in the process of shifting a little crucial bit towards uh, the cloud pipe mobile view of the world, uh, we have also been rapidly un uh, undergoing globalization uh, of a very important indeed, of course, globe-shattering kind. Uh, manufacturing hardware, whether it is in the form of welding sand grains together to make silicon chips or welding silicon chips together to make uh, quarterly uh, uh, financial statement processing boxes uh, uh, tied to data warehouses, uh, has been commoditized around the world to the point at which uh, the really only crucial question is uh, what Chinese company are you tied up with and how? Uh, the manufacturing of hardware, uh, never mind yet exactly how those socks of Martins are going to be created, the manufacturing of hardware uh, has become at the beginning of the 21st century what the manufacturing of shoes was uh, at the beginning of the 19th. It's a state of maturing industrialization uh, in rapidly developing economies. Uh, at the same time, uh, late in the 20th century, the Microsoft ecology began turning the second largest society and the largest free society on earth uh, in India into the software workshop of the world. Uh, and the commoditized manufacturing of software will occur uh, in the 21st century with the same enormous power uh, and the same globalized quality that the manufacturing of hardware does. Uh, this was why uh, the partnership that Michi and I have been forming uh, in stages over the last uh, six years has been a partnership about how SFLC.in joins the global structure of taking care of free software and its programmers that we have been laying out. Uh, so one thing that has happened then, uh, to sketch the business history of this, uh, is that at the end of the 20th century, the largest uh, enterprise IT manufacturers, first IBM and then Hewlett Packard, uh, realized uh, that what they wanted uh, was to commoditize the business of the software monopoly and destroy it. Uh, there was a, a, a real pathway uh, to doing that. It didn't lie in the Linux desktop. Uh, it lay in using free software, its tool chains, uh, its technologies, and most important, its highly capable people uh, to undermine the server-client paradigm uh, as it stood, or at least as Microsoft wishes it to stand, uh, as an all-Microsoft, all-proprietary, uh, very slowly maturing, basically anti-innovation monopolistic culture. That happened. It, it took billions of dollars of investment 
Uh, but it also required uh, the existence of some independent operations. Um, the, the largest companies that began to understand that the commoditization uh, and undermining of the Microsoft monopoly was in their interest did not want to distribute free software directly. Uh, as Karen uh, pointed out in the last session, there's always a reservoir of incomprehension, fear, and misunderstanding, uh, even inside the most adept organizations around the world with respect to free software and whatever open source is. Um, and it is uh, therefore true, of course, that part of the reason uh, that they did not want to distribute free software directly was that they were unnecessarily afraid of doing so. But there were enormous risk management advantages uh, to the cultivation of companies whose job was uh, packaging and branding and supporting free software for use by enterprise who weren't the enterprise companies themselves. When IBM came to Red Hat, it was a four or five person shop. Uh, by the time $12 million of investment had gone in, uh, Red Hat was on its way to the extraordinary position that it now holds uh, in the IT world, an S&P 500 company distributing bits you can get for free if you really want to uh, without bothering them. Uh, that's an immense achievement in business models, uh, an achievement noticed first, I guess, in a uh, in, a, in a sort of book-length way by a friend of ours called Martin Fink, who wrote the book on it in 2003. Um, but, but it was an astounding demonstration uh, of the benefit of intertwining the free and financed by capitalism operating for products for businesses way in which First IBM and then Hewlett Packard and then other companies found risk management sufficient to engage in this extraordinarily risky but ultimately immensely profitable attempt to transform the industry. Of course, <coughs> the minute my dear friends at IBM had created Red Hat, they began to fear it uh, because they had also fundamentally created Microsoft and it had nearly done them in. Uh, and so there began to grow a genetic belief in the smartest guys in the room uh, that there ought not to be only one such distributor of free bits in a productized, enterprise-ready, highly service-surrounded style. There was, at the, in the first decade of the 21st century, a lawsuit going on from a company called SCO, uh, and IBM was the defendant and had a lot of incentive to think about engineering the world, and a $50 million investment in Novell created both ultimately a beautiful legal defense in SCO, namely the plaintiff doesn't own anything, uh, and a second uh, similar enterprise distributor of server operating systems, uh, to cushion the possibility that software, even free software, could somehow again become a, a siphon leading revenue away from the makers of the IT themselves. Uh, and we moved into a period of, uh, 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 of bilateral, I can't call it duopoly, because of course it wasn't. They were all free bits. You could get them anywhere. Monopoly is a thing we never allow, but there grew up a very capable bilateral industry of competitors busily distributing this software for use primarily on business servers, uh, which was, after all, a successful investment by the, IT, the enterprise IT giants who had got uh, the distribution system that they wanted. Uh, were benefited by its vitality and protected against any possible anti-competitive consequences to them. I shan't bother having shortened my time to describe the ins and outs of that world as they managed it. I just need to tell you that it's over. It's over not because Novell is now a, um, a, a mainframe COBOL business subsidiary, uh, uh, or because the pathway turned out to be Red Hat wins, Microsoft loses, that's uh, not the point. It's true, but it isn't the point. What's happened is that virtualization has turned the server operating system into something it wasn't at the beginning of this process. Uh, the server operating system is now a paper cup containing a workload. The workload remains dominant and important 
The workload is the reason all of this exists. The workload is business process, gates being changed, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and rather than the server operating system being the thing that helps a piece of hardware do the work, uh, which is where the heavy iron builders intended it for it to be, the very ceaseless inventing activity of the industry, which we facilitated in every respect, VMware or not, I don't care, uh, the very ceaseless inventing that we facilitated in the industry has changed the paradigm to the point at which the business models now also must change. We haven't even approached yet Martin's earthquake. We are now only living in the harm being done by the public cloud vendors to the distribution companies, which threatens the reaccumulation of the kind of power over technology that we went out into the world to subdue last generation. The peculiar characteristic of this competition to be a paper cup holding a workload which my CTO, Clint Adams, is going to talk about more thoroughly this afternoon from the technical point of view. The business consequence of the containerization activity now going on around us uh, is that the distribution companies are now essentially holding on by the trademark on the side of the paper cup. It's a Red Hat container for a workload, or it's an Ubuntu container for a workload. And uh, unfortunately, that's not enough. The mere trademark on the paper cup containing the workload is too fragile. It does not sufficiently protect against a works just like approach on the part of the public cloud builder, who does not need to offer the actual trademark container uh, if it can offer instead a works just like trademark container when you're going to make 50,000 of them a year and destroy 120,000 or if you're a good business you're going to make 120,000 and destroy 50,000 such containers a year uh, and what you really want is the cheapest possible paper cup. The cheapest possible paper cup is a Debian paper cup because the the effort to manufacture paper cups will be won by the guy who wants to make them. So we are moving towards a competition between nonprofit and for-profit in the distribution of highly integrated versions of software usable in the cloud where the money is. Now, I don't mean the behavior tracking of consumers selling you a piece of pizza just when you get hungry money. That may be larger money. But the money that has fueled all of this, the money of selling enterprise IT, is undergoing a shakeout, which is going to put us in new and more complicated relations to one another than we've been before. I am not going to make anybody nervous in this room or elsewhere by speaking about the particular troubles that we are having these days. They are not important. They are merely the usual process of keeping the kinks out of everything. But we are moving in a direction which is going to cause us more heartburn than we have had so far in these relationships. And the skill with which we manage those is going to come in some substantial measure to weight on the shoulders of the lawyers. Because as we move into a period of convergence and divergence of kinds that the technology is pushing and that none of us are seeking, we are going to find ourselves having to look very closely at the legal relationships which have facilitated all of this so far. Some of them, my clients' arrangements in particular, are not regarded as subject to change. For the Free Software Foundation or any of my other clients, whether businesses are having heartburn or not, is, it's, not that they don't, it's not that they don't care, it's that they don't care. It's not their problem. It's companies and intrigue. Um, notwithstanding the fact that this ecology is one in which we must all exist, and there's no, dis there, there's no uh, functional discrimination here between plants and fungi, it, it, we, we must all be there, or it won't work. Making it work is going to take more trouble in the next 10 years than it took in the last 10. And it wasn't no trouble in the last 10. It's just going to come to seem it was easy. That's the first problem. As we move to cloud to mobile, 
the fundamental business models which have pinned the nonprofit and the for-profit communities together are going to converge in ways which are going to create frictional heating and we're going to have to figure out how to dissipate that heating. And even if I weren't minded to make sure that Red Hat continues to give the wonderful support to the Software Freedom Law Center that it does every year, uh, I would still feel Red Hat must survive. And even as I would hate for Mr. Ellison to stop writing the checks he writes every year, little positive as I have to say about him from speech to speech, his survival isn't important solely because of his donations to Software Freedom Law Center. I do think that his biggest problem is Martin Fink, but we need to worry about that right now. Or rather, we do need to worry about it. I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk, but in the meantime, I need to talk about the patent one. From the moment that GPL2 was promulgated in 1991, before I was working with him. Mr. Stallman has spent a lot of time doing what he does almost best, because what he really does best is design software and make systems. But he has been doing the second thing that he does really better than almost anybody else, which is jumping up and down and screaming. And he has been jumping up and down and screaming about the fact that there would be a patent nightmare and it would not only be impossible to make free software in the middle of this patent nightmare, but it would be impossible to make money out of free software in this patent nightmare, and the world would be deeply, deeply troubled by it. When we began GPL3's public process, uh, I arranged an interview between Richard and Steve Lohr of the New York Times, uh, who, of course, spent much more of his career as a journalist interviewing Steve Ballmer, which meant that talking to Richard was, I hope, a refreshing change for him. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and I was listening in another room uh, on a squawk box to the call, uh, and Steve said, Richard, did you ever think when you started all of this that it could get so big? And Richard said, no, of course not. He said, the minute I first heard about software patents, I knew we were doomed. Eben was more optimistic. So he spent a lot of time jumping up and down and telling people doom was coming, and everybody did with him what the faculty of Columbia Law School does with me. They ignored him. Maybe he'll stop shouting after a while if we just don't respond. And then the patent war came. And at a minimum, 30 some odd billion dollars have been spent on it. And we'll talk about it after lunch. And it will be all very sad because a lot has been wasted. And even though we have worked, Keith Burgelt more than anybody else, and I more than anybody else uh, I know except Keith Burgelt, we have worked to try and make community defense actually happen. We have put on miles and shoe leather, he an order of magnitude more than I, to try and convince people to stick together. Um, even though we have tried to generate community in the middle of the war, that's really very hard to do. The war is not yet burning itself out, but it's going to burn itself out. The people who have made a ton of money selling armaments into the war are beginning not to sell them quite as rapidly and as quite high prices as they did. And we can say by the dynamics of patent wars as we have studied them historically that this one has probably passed its peak and will tail down unless some new ammunition dumps suddenly go up in orange flares on the horizon. But nobody has yet begun thinking about the patent peace that will follow the patent war. And in particular, nobody has really undertaken, though I keep urging people to do it, nobody has really undertaken the thorough analysis necessary to understand how bad it will be when in the aftermath of the patent war, the world's largest patent system exists in the People's Republic of China and is unconnected to the rule of law. The IT economy of the world 10 years from now is going to be dominated by forms of monetization and competitive use of state-granted monopolies in the largest economy in the world where the neutrality of the courts cannot be trusted or called upon. People are going to get an aftermath of the patent war, which is going to feel to them like the patent war itself felt to us, like an out of control experience being run by people who do not have their interests at heart. And when we get there, which we will, it is not an inevitable outcome anymore. It will happen. When we get there, we will be watching what in the world of uh, military strategy is referred to as blowback. 
when the guns you sold into the war are being turned against you and your people. And this is not going to be a pleasant experience for people who thought that they had everything they needed to see it out. Now, some of the smartest guys in the room, and I do mean some of the very smartest guys in the room, have foreseen this in the sense that they have reinsured by good relationships with Chinese entities that are massive patent getters and will be massive reciprocal licensors of patents. They have, in effect, agreed to know-how trades already. And those know-how trades being made early in the process are being converted into relative immunities from what is about to happen to everybody else. But it is going to happen to everybody else. Unless, of course, it should turn out that another large country where software is made decides that it doesn't have to go along with the patent structures that have dominated the white world all this time and that have been adopted for national strategy purposes by the Chinese. SFLC.in discusses closely with the new Indian government its ideas about what might be done to facilitate, let us say, the $100 smartphone in India that the Prime Minister spoke about when he was here in New York. There are also going to be interesting changes in the global landscape post the patent war, and there will be new parties at the peace table. When this has burnt itself out and we get to the Congress of Versailles and we attempt to create uh, some kind of concert of the world about IT patenting, I am not going to release a timeline, unlike Martin, I am not being forced by atomic distances to figure out when is that going to happen. But when we get to the Congress of Vienna about this, we're going to find a diversity of attitudes and experiences in which the global experience of the free movement is going suddenly to seem more like home to a lot of businesses around the world. We and the Red Hat Company have been able to take an equivalently pure view of the patent mess in the United States. We was against it. And if we count up every brief Rob wrote to say that and every brief I wrote to say that to the Supreme Court, we'd have a you know, short stack of greens. Uh, but we did good because the Supreme Court now agrees with us. Uh, it may not agree with us completely. It may have left some openings for our friends at IBM and other places to say, but, 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 but this patent improves the performance of the computer, Your Honor. Uh, a move that um, Justin will say after lunch you should hire him to, to do for you. But, 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 but even so, uh, what we have accomplished is what I said back in the early days of the war would happen. Patent law is changing. The war does not leave patent law where patent law was when the war began. Change occurs fast in wartime. And the particular thing which has happened is that the conceptual lock on US patent law held by the pharmaceutical companies has been broken. The patent destiny of IT and the patent destiny of pharma, even in the United States, where pharma owns a superlative equity interest in the United States Congress, ha has now been broken. The destiny of IT patenting lies in just Judge Posner and the nine members of the Supreme Court who have gotten a little concerned about all this over-monopolizing through government means going on. And although I don't proposed to vote libertarian in 2016 even over Mr. Snowden, a matter I care more about than this even. It is true that the libertarian rising uh, in the pro-business party in the United States is not going to be favorable to over-patenting because to the libertarian point of view, government-issued monopolies in business are simply wrong. And in the same way that Joshua Wong may say to the Chinese Communist Party that time is on our side and we will be controlling your destiny before too long, the very difficulty that pro-business politics in the United States is going to have with libertarianism over the next decade is going to be reflected in a weakening of the patent system and it will weaken in IT because pharma will simply buy enough of the United States Senate to keep it from happening to them. So we are going to come to the eventual Congress of Vienna on patents in a decisively altered global world where U.S. patent law is no longer the most aggressive pro-protectionist law in the world and where the international economics of patent law are going to have a very different feeling. 
particularly to U.S. and European-centered countries. In all of this, in all of this, free software licensing is going to be far more important than anybody sees directly right now. We learned three things thanks to the activity of the Chinese national government last month, all of which are this month, all of which are really important. One, we learned that Samsung is paying Microsoft a billion dollars a year in patent royalties for Android. A billion dollars a year. Two, uh, we learned that Microsoft can no longer keep those arrangements secret. And three, we learned that the patent agreement on which Samsung is paying a million dollars of royalties a year, a billion dollars of royalties a year, excludes GPL3 software. I know why it excludes GPL3 software. I remember threatening Brad Smith sitting on my couch with what would happen when GPL3 was finished, and it has. So let's ask this question. What do we do with a world in which if the kernel were relicensed under GPL3, Samsung could save a billion dollars a year. What we're going to find when the war ticks down is that we created the possibilities for some of the institutions of durable patent peace last decade because we by then had been thinking about it for 20 years because Richard thought we were doomed and I thought maybe not. And we made those arrangements and we publicly discussed them and everybody on committee B, which I formed in order to have that discussion, discussed it without end. And in the middle, Microsoft went and did a sneaky thing and we busted them for it. And now we are essentially in a world in which the reason that we haven't adopted those solutions is because Verizon and AT&T didn't want GPL3 in the service platforms they were building and Hollywood didn't want anything in the world that ever showed a movie to be under a license that didn't permit lockdown. But everybody is suddenly going to discover a lot of tools lying around in shiny condition that we built in order to help them deal with these problems. And suddenly there is nine figures reasons for people to go and look again at what we did. All of this now brings us to why I was so happy that Martin decided to bend time and come here. Because the next step in the process on a pace that only a real time bender could possibly be insisting on. Even the laws of physics will be punched through unless those committee meetings uh, are successful and he's a lunatic after all. Whatever happens now, we are going to have fundamental changes in how computers work and what software does. And those changes are going to arrive more or less just about the time that we find ourselves at patent peace with the rights that have been fractured up and spread around the world about technologies which are fundamentally changing. Two things, therefore, will have to happen. We will have to figure out what the patent landscape is going to be in the new technology we are moving towards. And we're going to have to keep free software in there or everything is cooked. And by everything, I mean human freedom, not the profits of this company or that company. I have been teaching a course in this law school since 1997 called Computers, Freedom, and Privacy, which has been a small course, 12, 14, 16. It will never be a small course again. In fact, I used to have a complicated catalog entry that ex described why you would care about computers, privacy, and the Constitution. And after the summer of 2013, I just took the catalog entry out. I just said, see Snowden. And now it's a large course, and it will stay that way. Now, the reason that that's true uh, is that free software and freedom are closely related to one another. Richard knew that before anybody else in the world knew it, and he taught it to a few people like B. Dale and me, and we believed it. And now there's pretty much no literate, technologically sophisticated person in the world who hasn't gotten the point. To whatever degree their day jobs may permit them to act on it, everybody knows. 
Which is why if we have a fundamental transition in the actual technology of computing, and we don't keep free software in there, what is endangered is political liberty and social ability of people to live and change and become and do without data mining by state or powers in private property to stop them by being aware of it before they know it themselves. Which means that whatever it takes both from a companies and intrigue point of view and from a licensing point of view and from where we put our hacking point of view, we must begin to adjust ourselves not only to the changes that we have wrought so far, but to the changes that lie right around the corner and which will have further fundamental destabilizing effect. I told you I wanted to start the morning with the earthquake because there really isn't any way for me to sum up what has happened over the last 10 years and move to the next 10 without telling you that this, right here, this is the point of inflection. And for Martin to come and tell you what his timelines is tells you that I do mean point of inflection. I don't mean long period of inflection. I don't mean we get our feet set and then, I ha and then it happens to us. I mean the hurricane is already blowing and the water is already coming up through the sewers and we're going to need all the moxie we have to figure out how to live in this new warming world of ours. Now I actually think that this is not an improbable positive outcome. I by no means think we're doomed. That's what's so important about having the team from the machine here today. It's not that only we get it. It's that the most visionary technologists in the most important places in the world right now get it very temporarily. It could work. But it's a research project. No promises of delivery. And we got a lot of licensing work to do before we actually get there because Martin was simplifying today on his, I won't even describe what technology he was using. And simplifying when you're writing on a one of those um, is necessary, but it's all trickier than that. A new operating system with new structures may not need new programming languages, but it needs a whole lot of other things, and maybe that includes some licensing. And figuring that out and making sure that what we have will produce an ecology as commercially beneficial to everybody as the ecology we have had is an absolutely important commitment for us. The hackers may not see it that way. Their point of view is always that the only thing to do is the neat thing we are doing now. And I hope that the neat thing we are doing now is Freedom Box and other things like that. You know, I mean, we got to do it, guys, OK? It's, it's late. It's late. Right? I had a YouTube advertisement for Freedom Box I wanted to do back in 2012. It was just a screen black with a white logo on it. It said Freedom Box. By the time we have it ready, you'll know why you need one. Okay? On that, on, on that proposition, we have slipped the dates too far. Everybody in the world knows why they need one, but we don't have it there for them to get. Now, we will show you some other tricks this afternoon that we believe are also part of what we do for freedom in this next business of cloud to mobile. Because, of course, if we weren't thinking about that, we wouldn't be doing our jobs. But it's clear that we have a lot of rebuilding to do. We are making the Argonauts ship again, and we are doing it by replacing parts under motion. And we're not invisible and humble and poverty-stricken anymore. We are all together, all of us, the IT industry of the world, and we have this reconstructing to do. The tools we're coming in with are good. The levels of cooperation and trust and mutual understanding that we have built up over this time are good. The level of smart, well, that has to do with all these bright people who pass through school to work and off into all those places. We're fine in that sense. What free software has always been about is if you let people learn, if you let people experiment, if you let people share, you will be hip deep in neat stuff you didn't know was possible very soon because no social force in the world is more powerful than the curiosity of children. And we are still harnessing that 
force. The orders of magnitude scaling up we need about that is to harness all the curiosity of all the four billion children in the world, not the rich ones living in the rich societies. Which remains, from my operational point of view, what the free software movement is most deeply about. Scaling up human intelligence by bringing the ability to learn and understand technology to the poorest of the poor. But whatever we do about that, our basic intellectual and institutional infrastructure is pretty good. And it's going to take a lot of shaking and we're going to do some adaptive architecting on the fly. It isn't just the organizational structures, it isn't just the licensing, it isn't just the commercial and industrial diplomacy. It's all of that and another bunch of things too. But we are going to find ourselves in a polarized environment, polarized around technological structures that are now shaping up and which people do not fully understand yet. And there are vast amounts of money and vast commercial interests trying to understand faster than their users understand. Which is pretty much the way we were at the beginning of this process when Microsoft controlled the software industry. And debilitating users was also a major part of their activity. The public cloud vendors of the world, let's say that they are Microsoft and Facebook and we'll cut the list short there for reasons of comedy within the room. The public cloud vendors are, are, are changing the nature of information technology in a way that is scaring everybody else livid, as it should. Both for reasons of trust and freedom and for reasons of the ecological variety in the economic system that sustains invention. We are still the people who know how to achieve outcomes which don't involve blood on the floor, but which do involve behavioral change, transformative of industry. Been there, done that, not tired of doing it, must continue. We'll get it done. Thank you very much.